Hi everyone. I'm going to start this week with a couple of announcements. Firstly, just a reminder that the website is now up and running. You can listen to episodes, have direct link to our social media, and contact me directly through there. So please visit www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk. That's www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk. Finally, a quick plug for Patreon. A massive thank you to new member Laura, who has joined since the last episode. So that is www.patreon.com True Crime Fix Podcast. I'm trying to keep this show going and resist putting advertising in, interrupting your enjoyment. So if you're able to, please join and get the extra content for the price of a central London coffee. So that is www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast I'm just going to run a trailer for a colleague in the podcasting world and then it's on to this week's case Hi, this is Mike Morford You may know me as co-host of the true crime podcast Criminology I'd like to invite you to listen to one of my other podcasts called The Murder of My Family In each episode of The Murder of My Family I discuss a murder case and include an interview with a family member of the victim to discuss the aftermath of the murder in an attempt to view these crimes from a unique perspective, one that we don't usually experience. Some of the cases I cover are well known, while others you've probably never heard of. I currently have dozens of episodes available for you to binge on, including episodes about the Golden State Killer, the Delphi Murders, and the Colonial Parkway Murders, just to name a few. Here's a small sample of the kind of conversations you'll hear on The Murder of My Family. Mike, at the risk of sounding like every other proud big brother around the world, Kathy was an amazing person. She was 27 years old at the time of her death, and she'd already accomplished a great deal. One point that I wanted to get across was that the victims whose murders I discuss aren't just statistics or a blurb in a news report. These were real people whose murders affected their family members, forever changing their lives. It's important to know that they too are victims. For me, knowing that he has a family and that he gets to see his kids every day and that he gets to be there for his kids growing up, like, it's not fair. You know, my dad did everything he was supposed to do as a father and as a husband. And someone decided that night that he didn't get to do that anymore. It's frustrating knowing that, you know, he'll get to see his kids grow up and graduate and get married and do all that. And my dad doesn't get to do any of those things. He doesn't get to see his, he has three granddaughters now that he'll never see and they'll never meet their grandfather. And it's just, it's not fair. New episodes of The Murder of My Family come out every other Saturday. And you can find The Murder of My Family everywhere you listen to podcasts. Subscribe today so you don't miss an episode. True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one, and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. You're listening to the True Crime Base Podcast with your host, Steve. Hello again everyone, and welcome to our 20th case together. If you've enjoyed the show so far, please remember to subscribe on your chosen podcast directory, and all of the new episodes will automatically download for you upon release. The case this week takes me to West London for an incident which hit the national media almost five years ago to the day as I record this. This is a case that one of my listeners, Angie, requested that I cover, as it was local to her. I would like to thank Jenny Vidler for her assistance with the research in this case. Please be aware that the victim in this case is under the age of 16, so therefore may not be suitable for all listeners. Anyway, without further ado, this is your true crime fix. I'm your host, Steve. And this episode is dedicated to the memory of Alice Gross. 
Alice Poppy Madeline Gross was born on the 14th of February in the year 2000. She was the daughter of Rosalind Hodgkiss and Jose Gross, and she also had a sister, Nina. The family resided together in Hanwell, which is in the borough of Ealing in West London. For those who are unaware, Hanwell is a small town on the outskirts of London. The main high street is dominated by a clock tower, which was unveiled as part of the coronation of King George VI, the father of the current Queen of the United Kingdom, in 1937. This is not the only link to Head's estate that Hanwell has. The then 24-year-old former Vietnamese president, Ho Chi Minh, worked at the Drayton Court Hotel in the kitchen in 1914. Hanwell is seven miles from London's Heathrow Airport and is close to the main route into London city centre. Alice's close friends and family described her as a loving, loyal and quirky girl with a lively sense of comedy and a compassionate nature. She played the violin and piano and could turn her hand to any instrument. She was learning the guitar and hoped to eventually have a career in music. Alice was five foot two inches tall, with a slim build and shoulder length brown hair. She attended Brentside High School on the border between Hanwell and Greenford, but she was also a student at the Forecast Academy, which was a theatre and stage school based in Clapham, South London. The co-founder of the school, Oliver Boito, was also Alice's singing teacher. He described Alice at the academy. She was quite humble about her talent and skills, but would have been the first to join in. She was subtle and also had a great sense of humour. Her talent really shone through. He posted to YouTube a number of performances by Alice, so I'm going to briefly play you a clip of her practising for one of her performances. Please hang around at the end of the episode as I will play one of Alice's original songs which she performed so that you could hear how talented she really was. On the 28th of August 2014, Alice pulled on her dark blue jeans, a dark green lacy cardigan and denim blue van shoes and left her home at approximately one o'clock in the afternoon informing her mum Rosalind that she would be home by six. She made the short walk towards the Grand Union Canal and headed south in the direction of Kew, an area in the borough of Richmond where the Royal Botanical Gardens are. The Grand Union Canal is a stretch of water which links London to Birmingham, passing through the rolling countryside, industrial towns and peaceful villages on its 137 mile journey. The canal then branches into the River Brent before joining the River Thames, whilst the main body continues to meander its way west. A very relaxing walk for a summer's day. At around 2.30pm, Alice was spotted at Brentford Lock, about three miles from her home via the CCTV system at the Holiday Inn at this time, she was heading south towards Kew. 
Alice was unmistakable on the footage as she swung her arms when she walked in a motion as if she was marching. Alice was spotted again in the same location heading back towards Hanwell at 3.45pm. The next sighting of Alice was two miles further up the canal at the Trumpers Way Bridge at 4.26pm heading back in the general direction of home. But she did not arrive. When she did not return at 6pm, Alice's mum Rosalind became very worried. She called the police who attended the family home and took a statement. During this initial statement, the police learnt that Alice was suffering from anorexia and Rosalind was concerned that Alice's mental health had led to her disappearance. Crucially, it was also discovered that Alice had left her money and Oyster card at home, which meant that when she had left, she did not have the intention of going very far. For those people outside the UK who are not sure what an Oyster card is, it is a ticket which is issued to users of the Transport for London services, which is topped up and allows the user discounted travel over paper tickets on the buses and trains. Alice had still not turned up three days later, so on the 1st of September, the family made an appeal for her to get in touch with them, saying that they desperately missed her. The appeals that you are going to hear next were made through the BBC and are from her sister Nina, followed by her mum Rosalind and her dad Jose. It's hard because I miss her and I just really hope that she knows that we really, really love her and we really need her back because she's, 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 she's love her. Alice is an amazing daughter. She's, um, she's smart, she's kind, she's funny. She's incredibly creative and talented. She's just a, an amazing daughter. I miss the sound of her voice. It's a, a really, really big part of our family and there's a massive hole now. Uh, we really need her back as soon as possible. Her family put out appeals on Facebook and Twitter. In one Facebook message, Nina Gross wrote, The police have requested to hold off any non-police searches as they are actively searching certain areas this morning until further notice. But please continue to raise awareness with posts and posters. On the 3rd of September, the Metropolitan Police's headquarters, Scotland Yard's Homicide and Major Crimes Unit, took over the hunt for Alice. Detective Chief Inspector Andy Chalmers said, As a matter of course, the investigation has now been taken over by the Homicide and Major Crime Command, but we will continue to liaise closely with our borough colleagues to find Alice. He said, It's not unusual in such cases for homicide officers to provide additional expertise and a fresh perspective. Mr Chalmers added, I would like to stress that there has been no change to the status of the investigation. This is and continues to be treated as a missing persons inquiry. Alice's mother Rosalind appealed for her daughter to let someone know that you're safe on the Find Alice Gross Facebook page. In the message she wrote, You may be sad, you may be angry, you may be hurt, you may be scared too. I just want to hug and to hold you. Know that we love you and are there for you whatever you are going through. Alice, please come home. Mum, with six kisses at the end. Police again appealed for anyone who had seen Alice on the towpath or had befriended her whilst she was on a songwriting workshop at the Camden Roundhouse to contact them. On the 4th of September, the police released CCTV footage of the last time that Alice was seen. 
The footage showed her walking along the Grand Union Canal towpath near the Holiday Inn at Brentford Lock. When she had left, Alice had been wearing a purple rucksack. The police had now found the bag and it still contained items which Alice's family confirmed were hers. The bag had been found alongside the towpath in the vicinity of the last sighting of her. Inside the rucksack was the shoes that she was wearing when she went missing. Her family made new appeals to help find Alice. Her mother Rosalind said, We'd like to say to Alice first of all that we miss her, that we love her, and that she is not in any trouble, and we want to know that she's safe. We just want her to come home. On the 6th of September, the police arrested a 25-year-old man in the Ealing area on suspicion of murder. The detectives also released pictures of five cyclists riding past the spot where Alice was last seen. They wanted to track them down as they believed that they may have vital information as to her disappearance. On the 7th of September, police divers started to search the Grand Union Canal for clues as to Alice's disappearance. Sniffer dogs were brought in to help scour an expanded search area. The entire route that Alice was known to have taken was approximately three miles in each direction, but as Alice's intended destination and actual destination was not known, it could have been even further than that. A second unnamed man who was 51 years old was arrested on the suspicion of murder in the afternoon. The police said that the two arrests were independent of each other and stressed that it remained a missing persons inquiry. On the 8th of September, the police requested and were granted more time to question their first suspect. The second suspect was also released with no further action to be taken against them. On the 9th of September, the 25-year-old man who had been arrested was released on bail until mid-September. On the 11th of September, the police said they were still searching for Alice's missing iPhone, which they believed may have been taken from her rucksack and may hold key information to help find her. On the 16th of September, detectives finally announced a suspect that they were looking for. Posters asking for information with regards to Alice's disappearance were all over the local area. Yellow ribbons were being worn by everyone trying to sustain the awareness of the search for Alice. But there was also a separate batch of missing person posters going up as yet another family was missing the patriarch. The attention of the police had been drawn to 41-year-old Latvian builder Arnis Zolkens and they wanted to speak to him in relation to Alice's disappearance. He had last been seen at his home in Ealing on the 3rd of September. Zolkens was known to travel to work along a similar route to that which Alice had taken on the day that she disappeared. With Zulkins now becoming the prime suspect, police revealed that the 25-year-old arrested on suspicion of murder had been told that he would face no further action. On Thursday the 18th of September, forensic searches were carried out at Zulkins' home in Ealing, where he had been living with his partner. On the following day, police started searching a second property in Boston Road in Hanwell. Landlord Radoslav Andrich said the building was split into bedsits and that Zolkins had lived there before moving out more than a year ago. He said he last saw him at the property two days before Alice went missing. Detectives prepared to make an appeal for help to find Alice on BBC's Crime Watch. But in the interim, 
they dug a little further into the background of Arna's Zulkins and found out that the builder who had arrived in the United Kingdom in 2007 had a dark past. Zulkins had served seven years in jail for killing his wife, Rudite Zulkins, who was 22 at the time in Latvia in 1998. Speaking with the Daily Mail in an article on the 19th of September, the mother of Rudite revealed that Zulkins tricked her daughter into going into a deserted forest, claiming that they were on their way to pick up a new motorbike he had bought her. Once alone, he bludgeoned her over the head with a scaffold pole before stabbing her through the chest. He then pushed her body into a grave which he had already dug, covering her with soil and leaves. Zulkins then toasted her murder by drinking a bottle of vodka as he stood over her shallow grave. Rudite's mother gave the interview from her apartment on the outskirts of Riga, the Latvian capital. She said, I feared he might kill again. Once you have tasted blood, the taste stays with you, never stop. He killed our lovely daughter and destroyed our family. I'm still angry at the length of his sentence. This was a callous and heartless murder with no remorse. My daughter was trained in karate and she could not fight him off. He prepared my daughter's grave in advance and planted the weapons next to it. Then he tricked her into going into the forest. Following his release from prison in 2005, Zulkins moved within Latvia to Liepia and started a new family. But when his new wife was warned that she was married to a killer, he moved to London. Two years later, he was arrested in Ealing over an alleged indecent assault on a 14-year-old girl but was never prosecuted because the victim was unable to substantiate her account. Police had discovered and subsequently released new CCTV footage showing Zulkan cycling along the same isolated towpath near Trumpers Way Bridge just 15 minutes after Alice had walked the route. Detective Superintendent Carl Murta who was overseeing the inquiry into Alice's disappearance, said, They were both going in the same direction, so it is clear that he would have passed her. The focus of this investigation is now what happened when this took place. It is extremely urgent that we contact Arnus and question him about the matter of Alice's disappearance. We also want to speak to anyone who may have seen him or who may have helped him by giving him money or somewhere to stay. The police issued an all ports and airports alert for Zulkins and urged people not to approach him but dial 999 if they saw him. They also announced a reward of up to £20,000 to anyone with information that led detectives to find Alice. On the 25th of September, the police used a cadet to reconstruct the last known movements of Alice from Hanwell to Brentford Lock and back again. They hoped that the cadet who adopted Alice's mannerisms and distinctive power walk would jog the memory of some of the people who may have seen her. The police also identified Elthorne Park as an area of interest. Elthorne Park was very near to the last sighting of Alice at Trumpers Way Bridge at 4.26pm, just past the estuary where the Grand Union Canal flowed into the River Brent. Detective Superintendent Murta said, Just as Alice reached the Trumpers Way Bridge, it started to rain heavily. Think back and try and remember if you were out and about in the area that afternoon. 
It was during the summer holidays and the canal is a really popular place locally. We know that Alice loved the rain so she probably would have kept walking in it rather than seeking shelter. There are many paths and turnoffs from the canal towpath. We don't know the route that Alice took, so please think back to that Thursday four weeks ago and call us if you can help. The investigation team had, at this point, followed 729 lines of inquiry, spoken to 1,067 people and taken more than 1,000 calls but there had still been no confirmed sightings of Alice. Scotland Yard detectives also announced that the bike that Zolkins had been riding was recovered on the 19th of September, but they would not reveal where it had been found. The investigation was now the biggest that the Metropolitan Police had conducted since the bombings of the 7th of July 2005. On the 30th of September came the news that Alice's family were dreading. The announcement was made by Commander Graham McNulty outside Scotland Yard to the awaiting media on the 1st of September. Last night, the 30th of September, a search was carried out at the River Brent as part of our ongoing investigation into the disappearance of Alice Gross. Following this search, we have sadly recovered a body from the water. This is obviously a significant development and Alice's family have been informed. We are unable to make a formal identification at this stage, but clearly this news is devastating for Alice's family and friends. My thoughts are with them at this time and I would ask you to respect their privacy and allow them some space. This is now a murder investigation and I need the public's help to find out whoever is responsible. I would urge anyone who may know something to come forward. Even if you have not yet spoken out, it is not too late to tell us what you know. I would like to thank the local community of Ealing who have shown us huge support and patience during the course of our investigation. This discovery will have a significant impact throughout the borough. You only need to walk around the surrounding streets to see the effect that Alice's disappearance has had on the whole community. Our work at this scene is crucial to ensure we capture all the available evidence, allowing us to identify who is responsible for this dreadful crime. This may take some time and I would ask people to remain patient with us. I can confirm that significant efforts were made to conceal the body. For several reasons, including protecting the investigation, I do not wish to comment any further at this point on the circumstances. Finally, I would like to reiterate my request that Alice's family and friends are given the time to come to terms with this news. My thoughts, and all of us within the Metropolitan Police Service, are with them at this very difficult time. The initial post-mortem examination began at Uxbridge Mortuary, but due to the complex nature of the case, further tests would be needed to determine the cause of death. Dr Fiona Wilcox, the senior coroner for the area of Inner West London, described the scene in her report which was subsequently released. Alice's body had been found on the bed of the shallow part of the River Brent. Her body had been intentionally weighed down and concealed, but her time of death was deemed to be significantly earlier, estimated as soon after her disappearance. Alice had been tied in a fetal position, wrapped in bin bags which had been weighed down with a bike wheel, which had bricks tied to it and covered with six sections of a tree trunk in a pyramid formation. It was predicted at a later date that the concealment of Alice would have taken nearly 27 hours, during which time CCTV showed Zolkins going to a local off-licence to buy two cans of Carlsberg beer. 
fire crews were needed to remove the heavy tree trunks placed on top of Alice's body, which was naked apart from one sock. The cause of death had been recorded as compression asphyxia, which is a heavy weight on the chest. It was predicted that she had been murdered in the vicinity of where she was found. It was also mentioned that she had died before entering the water. Alice's parents said that they had been left completely devastated, but thanked the local community for its help in the search. Alice's parents, Rosalind and Jose, said, It is difficult to comprehend that our sweet and beautiful daughter was the victim of a terrible crime. Why anybody would want to hurt her is something that we are struggling to come to terms with. Alice was a loving and much-loved daughter and sister, a quirky live spark of a girl, beautiful inside and out. She was a funny companion, a loyal friend, both passionate and compassionate, and so talented with a bright future ahead of her. She brought so much joy to our family and those who knew her. Her school said in a statement, Alice was an outstanding and talented student who will be sorely missed from our school community. This is a very sad day for our school and we are devastated by this tragic loss. We are doing everything we can to support each other and will continue to do so in the days and weeks ahead. Arna Zulkins was still at large, however. Or was he? On the 4th of October 2014, at just after 2pm, the police found a badly decomposed body hanging from a tree in the woodland of Boston Manor Park, which was around a 20-minute walk along the River Brent from where Alice had been found. The body was discovered in dense woodland. A Metropolitan Police statement said, Although no formal identification has been made, early indications suggest that the body may be that of Arna Zulkins. We have updated his partner and a family liaison officer is supporting her. On the 23rd of October, the funeral of Alice Gross took place. Her coffin was decorated with patterns which depicted a meadow scene and Alice's three cats, painted by her grandmother, her sister and a family friend because Alice loved nature. The family said that the funeral service was a humanist service and featured videos of Alice playing and singing songs she wrote herself. The funeral cortege passed through Hamwell Town Centre. Candles and flowers were placed around the clock tower in tribute to Alice. Traffic came to a standstill and locals came out to pay their respects as the cortege went past. The service was a private occasion. In a statement, Alice's family said, Alice was so spirited, so present, so vital and so full of promise. We find it almost impossible to understand what has happened and that we have to say goodbye to her. We want Alice's funeral to focus on the joy of Alice's life and the joy of having known her. If you do excuse me, my dear listener, I'm going to skip forward a little bit in the chronology as I want to end on Alice and not what happened in the aftermath. As you are aware, there'll be no court case this week, no judgment. But there was an inquest held on the 27th of January 2015. The Crown Prosecution Service, the body that indicated to detectives they have enough evidence to prosecute, revealed that after studying Scotland Yard's investigation into Alice's death, there would have been sufficient evidence to provide a realistic prospect of conviction and therefore enough evidence to charge Zulkins with murder if he was still alive. 
they announced that they believed that Alice was murdered before she was reported missing, and that Zulkan's motive was most likely sexual. There is no eyewitness evidence, said Tim Thompson, Deputy Chief Crown Prosecutor for CPS London. The scientific evidence does not link Arna Zulkan's directly to Alice's death. Nonetheless, the evidence as a whole gives rise to a circumstantial case that would clearly have met the full code test for Crown Prosecutors. Here's a summary of the evidence found. CCTV suggests that Zulkins would have overtaken Alice as she was walking on the towpath on the 28th of August. The footage suggests that he must have stopped for at least 80 minutes and when he reappeared on camera, his appearance indicated that he may have been in the water. Zulkins returned to the towpath that evening the following morning and again the following evening. DNA found on a well-preserved cigarette butt found metres from Alice's body was also matched to Zulkin's. DNA evidence also strongly suggested that Zulkin's was in contact with Alice's body. One of the bags used to conceal Alice's body matched a roll of bags seized from Zulkin's workplace. Both the roll and the bag in the river were spattered with paint. And finally, Alice's sister was also confident that an iPhone cover hidden in Zulkin's garden belonged to Alice. Alice's family said that they were confident in the conclusions of the police investigation and thanked officers for their support and professionalism. Although we now have certain information about how Alice died, we are still left with a number of serious unanswered questions about what the authorities knew or should have known about the man who is believed to have killed our daughter when he came to the UK, they said. Alice believed in the free movement of people, and so do we. For her sake, we are determined to ask these questions responsibly and sensitively. Tim Thompson, CPS prosecutor, said, Of all the people the various strands of evidence might have implicated, they in fact point towards Arna Zulkins, a person who had previously killed and concealed the body of a young woman. It is not for the CPS to say whether or not Arna Zulkins killed Alice Gross. That would have been for a jury to decide. So now I'm going to skip back. As I said, I wanted to end on Alice. On the 2nd of November 2014, a memorial was held for Alice at Greenford Town Hall and all residents were invited. Alice's parents spoke to the hundreds of well-wishers who had queued in driving rain to attend the celebration of their daughter. Ahead of the service, Alice's parents said they were particularly keen for the, in quotes, ribbon fairies and those who attended to the flowers at the clock tower to attend. The leader of Ealing Council, Julian Bell, thanked volunteers who bathed our borough in yellow. Representatives from the Ealing Half Marathon and sports clubs including Hanwell Town FC, Hanwell Rugby Football Club, Brentford Football Club, Ealing Trailfinders Rugby Football Club, Chelsea Football Club and Queen's Park Rangers Football Club were also invited. Alice's parents thanked all of the local people for their help in the hunt for Alice. The service included two songs recorded by Alice herself, including a cover of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, which left many people in tears. Rosalind told the congregation of about 500 people, I have been numbed by shock and grief. I have felt 
outrage and anger at the loss of her life, an unbelievable sadness at the emptiness that has been left. I have racked my brains for all the what ifs of that day. Anything that might have stopped this random, incomprehensible tragedy. It is even harder to talk about the pain than it is to talk about Alice. I cannot imagine life without Alice. I think of all the hugs, shared jokes, evenings spent snuggled on the sofa, goodnight kisses, the confidence of after school conversations, Alice playing the piano in her dressing gown and singing, shopping, baking, the way Alice still called me mummy. The future seems so bleak without Alice. It is only the incredible support of family and friends and the wider community that has kept us going. The celebration which was led by Caroline Black, a humanist celebrant who had also presided over Alice's funeral, included more music, poetry and speeches. A number of poems were read, including one written by Brian Clark about the yellow ribbons of hope that were festooned around the neighbourhood while the search for Alice had taken place. To Alice by Brian Clark We only physically leave our mother at birth. Only the tangible cord is cut. A more profound connection remains deep in the core of parent and child. A bond of transcendent worth. We watched you grow, delighted by your cheeky smile. With growing pride, we watched your widening scope, your strengthening stride, to your future full of hope, your love of music, family, your power to beguile, and by the love that you have always shown. Marked by yellow ribbons on every tree, you've brought us all together, offered the key which opens us to life, each to the other known. From here we hold you close within our lives. Your life changed ours, so now your love survives. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said to you at the start, I wanted to play you Alice's song, Don't Let It Go Away. Obviously I can't play the whole thing as I do not own the rights to it, but I thought I'd use some of it in tribute to such a talented artist. I will post the video to the True Crime Fix Discussion Facebook page and post a link in the show notes and on our website. So that's it for this week. Please remember if you enjoy the show or want to know more, please follow us on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod. The podcast also has a Facebook page, True Crime Fix Podcast, but there's also a fan page, True Crime Fix Discussion. I am thoroughly enjoying interacting with everyone on there, and this is where I post the majority of the information on the week's cases. You can also visit the new website, 
through crimefixpodcast.co.uk. That's www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk. Also a reminder that the podcast is now on Patreon, so please visit www.patreon.com forward slash truecrimefixpodcast. That's www.patreon.com forward slash truecrimefixpodcast. I also have an Instagram account, so search True Crime Fix. Also, if you have any suggestions or feedback for the show, please contact me at truecrimefixpodcast at gmail.com. That's truecrimefixpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, stay safe, look after each other, and live life to the fullest, because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner. Take care, everyone.